Any hints, Mike asked. We're kind of tired of working hard, especially for nothing. Well, the first step is telling the truth, said Rich Dad. We haven't been lying, I said. I did not say you were lying. I said to tell the truth, Rich Dad came back. The truth about what, I asked. How you're feeling, Rich Dad said. You don't have to say it to anyone else, just yourself. You mean the people in this park, the people who work for you, Mrs. Martin, they don't do that, I asked. I doubt it, Rich Dad said. Instead, they feel the fear of not having money. Instead of confronting the fear, they react instead of think. They react emotionally instead of using their heads, Rich Dad said, tapping us on our heads. Then they get a few bucks in their hands, and again the emotion of joy and desire and greed take over. And again they react instead of think. So their emotions do their thinking, Mike said. That's correct, said Rich Dad. Money is running their lives, and they refuse to tell the truth about that. Money is in control of their emotions, and hence their souls. Rich Dad sat quietly, letting his words sink in. Realizing we had absorbed as much as possible of what he was talking about, Rich Dad said, I want you boys to avoid that trap. That is really what I want to teach you. Not just to be rich, because being rich does not solve the problem. It doesn't, I asked, surprised. No, it doesn't. Let me finish with the other emotion, which is desire. Some call it greed, but I prefer desire. It's perfectly normal to desire something better prettier, more fun or exciting. So people also work for money because of desire. They desire money for the joy they think it can buy. But the joy that money brings is often short-lived. And they soon need more money for more joy, more pleasure, more comfort, more security. So they keep working, thinking money will soothe their souls that are troubled by fear and desire. But money cannot do that. Even for rich people, Mike asked, Rich people included, said Rich Dad. In fact, the reason many rich people are rich is not because of desire, but because of fear. They actually think that money can eliminate that fear of not having money, of being poor. So they amass tons of it only to find out that the fear gets worse. They now fear losing it. I have friends who keep on working even though they have plenty. I know people who have millions who are more afraid now than when they were poor. They're terrified of losing all their money. I want to teach you to master the power of money, not be afraid of it. And they don't teach that in school. If you don't learn it, you can become a slave to money. It was finally making sense. He did want us to widen our views, to see what Mrs. Martin could not see, his employees could not see, or my dad for that matter. He used examples that sounded cruel at the time, but I've never forgotten them. My vision widened that day, and I could begin to see the trap that lay ahead for most people. You see, we're all employees, ultimately. We just work at different levels, said Rich Dad. I just want you boys to have a chance to avoid the trap. The trap caused by those two emotions, fear and desire. Use them in your favor, not against you. That's what I want to teach you. I'm not interested in just teaching you to make a pile of money. That won't handle the fear or desire. If you don't first handle fear and desire and you get rich, you'll only be a high-paid slave. So how do we avoid the trap, I asked. The main cause of poverty or financial struggle is fear and ignorance, not the economy or the government or the rich. It's self-inflicted fear and ignorance that keeps people trapped. So you boys go to school and get your college degrees. I'll teach you how to stay out of the trap. The pieces of the puzzle were appearing. My highly educated dad had a great education and a great career, but school never told him how to handle money or his fears. It became clear that I could learn different and important things from two fathers. So you've been talking about the fear of not having money. How does the desire of money affect our thinking? Mike asked. How did you feel when I tempted you with a pay raise? Did you notice your desires rising? We nodded our heads. By not giving into your emotions, you were able to delay your reactions and think. That's most important. We will always have emotions of fear and greed. From here on in, it's most important for you to use those emotions to your advantage and for the long term. 
and not simply let your emotions run you by controlling your thinking. Most people use fear and greed against themselves. That's the start of ignorance. Most people live their lives chasing paychecks, pay raises, and job security because of the emotions of desire and fear, not really questioning where those emotion-driven thoughts are leading them. It's just like the picture of a donkey dragging a cart with its owner dangling a carrot just in front of the donkey's nose. The donkey's owner may be going where he wants to go, but the donkey is chasing an illusion. Tomorrow there will only be another carrot for the donkey. You mean the moment I began to picture a new baseball glove, candy or toys that's like a carrot to a donkey, Mike asked? Yeah. And as you get older, your toys get more expensive. New car, boat, and a big house to impress your friends, said Rich Dad with a smile. Fear pushes you out the door, and desire calls to you, enticing you toward the rocks. That's the trap. So what's the answer, Mike asked. What intensifies fear and desire is ignorance. That's why rich people with lots of money often have more fear the richer they get. Money is the carrot, the illusion. Rich Dad went on to explain that a human's life is a struggle between ignorance and illumination. He explained that once a person stops searching for information and knowledge of oneself, ignorance sets in. That struggle is a moment-to-moment -moment decision to learn to open or close one's mind. Look, school is very, very important. You go to school to learn a skill or a profession so as to be a contributing member of society. Every culture needs teachers, doctors, mechanics, artists, cooks, business people, police officers, firefighters, soldiers. Schools train them so our culture can thrive and flourish, said Rich Dad. Unfortunately for many people, school is the end, not the beginning. What does ignorance have to do with greed and fear, I asked. Because it's ignorance about money that causes so much greed and so much fear, said Rich Dad. Let me give you some examples. A doctor wanting more money to better provide for his family raises his fees. By raising his fees, it makes health care more expensive for everyone. Now it hurts the poor people the most, so poor people have worse health than those with money. Because the doctors raise their rates, the attorneys raise their rates. Because the attorney's rates have gone up, school teachers want to raise, which raises our taxes, and on and on and on. Soon there will be such a horrifying gap between the rich and the poor that chaos will break out, and another great civilization will collapse. Great civilizations collapsed when the gap between the haves and the have-nots was too great. America's on the same course, proving once again that history repeats itself, because we do not learn from history. We only memorize historical dates and names, not the lesson. Aren't prices supposed to go up, I asked? Not in an educated society with a well-run government. Prices should actually come down. Of course, that's often only true in theory. Prices go up because of greed and fear caused by ignorance. If schools taught people about money, there would be more money and lower prices. But schools only focus on teaching people to work for money not how to harness money's power. But don't we have business schools, Mike asked? Aren't you encouraging me to go to business school for my master's degree? Yes, said Rich Dad. But all too often business schools train employees who are sophisticated bean counters. Heaven forbid a bean counter takes over a business. All they do is look at the numbers, fire people, and kill the business. I am teaching you, Rich Dad said quietly. What have you taught me? Nothing, I said angrily. You haven't even talked to me once since I agreed to work for Peanuts. Ten cents an hour, huh? I should notify the government about you. We have child labor laws, you know. My dad works for the government, you know. Wow, said Rich Dad. Now you sound like most of the people who used to work for me. People I've either fired or they've quit. So what do you have to say, I demanded, feeling pretty brave for a little kid. How do you know that I've not taught you anything, asked Rich Dad calmly. Well, you've never talked to me. I've worked for three weeks and you've not taught me anything, I said with a pout. Does teaching mean talking or a lecture, Rich Dad asked. Well, yes, I replied. That's how they teach you in school, he said, smiling. But that is not how life teaches you. And I would say that life is the best teacher of all. Most of the time, life does not talk to you, just sort of pushes you around.
Each push is life saying, wake up, there's something I want you to learn. I had no idea what he was talking about. Life pushes all of us around. Some give up, others fight. A few learn the lesson and move on. They welcome life pushing them around. To these few people it means they need and want to learn something. They learn and move on. Most quit. And a few like you, fight. Rich Dad stood and shut the creaky old wooden window that needed repair. If you learn this lesson, you will grow into a wise, wealthy, and happy young man. If you don't, you will spend your life blaming a job, low pay, or your boss for your problems. You'll live life hoping for that big break that'll solve all your money problems. Rich Dad looked over to me to see if I was still listening. His eyes met mine. We stared at each other, streams of communication going between us through our eyes. Finally, I pulled away once I had absorbed his last message. I knew he was right. I was blaming him, and I did ask to learn. I was fighting. Rich Dad continued, Or if you're the kind of person who has no guts, you just give up every time life pushes you. If you're that kind of person, you'll live all your life playing it safe, doing the right things, saving yourself for some event that never happens. Then you die a boring old man. You'll have lots of friends who'll really like you because you were such a nice, hard-working guy. You spent a life playing it safe, doing the right things. But the truth is, you let life push you into submission. Deep down, you were terrified of taking risks. You really wanted to win, but the fear of losing was greater than the excitement of winning. Deep inside, you and only you will know that you didn't go for it. You chose to play it safe. Our eyes met again. For ten seconds we looked at each other, only pulling away once the message was received. You've been pushing me around, I asked. Some people might say that, smiled Rich Dad. I would say that I just gave you a taste of life. What taste of life, I asked, still angry but not curious. You boys are the first people that have ever asked me to teach them how to make money. I have more than 150 employees and not one of them has asked me what I know about money. They ask me for a job and a paycheck, but never to teach them about money. So most will spend the best years of their lives working for money, not really understanding what it is they're working for. I sat there listening intently. So when Mike told me about you wanting to learn how to make money, I decided to design a course that was close to real life. I could talk till I was blue in the face, but you wouldn't hear a thing. So I decided to let life push you around a bit so you could hear me. That's why I only paid you 10 cents. So what is the lesson I learned from working for only 10 cents an hour, I asked? That you're cheap and exploit your workers? Rich Dad laughed heartily. You best change your point of view. Stop blaming me, thinking I'm the problem. If you think I'm the problem, then you have to change me. If you realize that you're the problem, then you can change yourself, learn something, and grow wiser. But you only pay me ten cents. So what are you learning? Rich Dad asked, smiling. That you're cheap, I said with a sly grin. See, you think I'm the problem, said Rich Dad. But you are. Well, keep that attitude and you learn nothing. Keep the attitude that I'm the problem and what choices do you have? Well, if you don't pay me more or show me more respect and teach me, I'll quit. Well put, Rich Dad said. And that's exactly what most people do. They quit and go looking for another job, better opportunity, and higher pay, actually thinking that a new job or more pay will solve the problem. In most cases, it won't. So what will solve the problem, I asked? Just take this measly ten cents an hour and smile? Rich Dad smiled. That's what the other people do. Just accept a paycheck, knowing that they and their family will struggle financially. But that's all they do. Waiting for a raise, thinking that more money will solve the problem. Most just accept it, and some take a second job working harder, but again accepting a small paycheck. I sat staring at the floor, beginning to understand the lesson Rich Dad was presenting. I could sense it was a taste of life. Finally, I looked up and repeated the question. So what will solve the problem? This, he said, 
tapping me gently on the head, this stuff between your ears. It was at that moment that Rich Dad shared the pivotal point of view that separated him from his employees and my poor dad, and led him to eventually become one of the richest men in Hawaii, while my highly educated but poor dad struggled financially all his life. It was a singular point of view that made all the difference over a lifetime. Rich Dad said over and over this point of view, which I call lesson number one. The rich don't work for money. On that bright Saturday morning, I was learning a completely different point of view from what I had been taught by my poor dad. At the age of nine, I grew aware that both dads wanted me to learn. Both dads encouraged me to study, but not the same things. My highly educated dad recommended that I do what he did. Son, I want you to study hard, get good grades, so you can find a safe, secure job with a big company, and make sure it has excellent benefits. My rich dad wanted me to learn how money works, so I could make it work for me. These lessons I would learn through life with his guidance, not because of a classroom. My rich dad continued my first lesson. I'm glad you got angry about working for ten cents an hour. If you'd not gotten angry, and had gladly accepted it, I would have to tell you that I could not teach you. You see, true learning takes energy, passion, a burning desire. Anger is a big part of that formula, for passion is anger and love combined. When it comes to money, most people want to play it safe and feel secure. So, passion does not direct them; fear does. So is that why they'll take a job with low pay? I asked. Yes, said Rich Dad. Some people say I exploit people because they don't pay as much as the sugar plantation or the government. I say people exploit themselves. It's their fear, not mine. But don't you feel you should pay them more? I asked. I don't have to. And besides, more money will not solve the problem. Just look at your dad. He makes a lot of money, and he still can't pay his bills. Most people, given more money, only get into more debt. So that's why the ten cents an hour. I said, smiling. It's a part of the lesson. That's right, smiled Rich Dad. You see, your dad went to school and got an excellent education, so he could get a high-paying job, which he did. But he still has money problems because he never learned anything about money at school. On top of that, he believes in working for money, and. You don't? I asked. No, not really," said Rich Dad. "If you want to learn to work for money, then stay in school. That's a great place to learn to do that. But if you want to learn how to have money work for you, then I will teach you that. But only if you want to learn. Wouldn't everyone want to learn that?" I asked. "No," said Rich Dad. "Simply because it's easier to learn to work for money, especially if fear is your primary emotion when the subject of money is discussed." I don't understand," I said with a frown. "Oh, don't worry about that for now. Just know that it's fear that keeps most people working at a job: the fear of not paying their bills, the fear of being fired, the fear of not having enough money, the fear of starting over. That's the price of studying to learn a profession or trade and then working for money. Most people become a slave to money and then get angry at their boss. Learning to have money work for you is a completely different course of study." I asked. "Absolutely," Rich Dad answered. "Absolutely." We sat in silence. My friends would have been just starting their little league baseball game, but for some reason I was now thankful I decided to work for ten cents an hour. I sensed that I was about to learn something my friends would not learn in school. "Ready to learn?" asked Rich Dad. "Absolutely," I said with a grin. I've kept my promise. I've been teaching you from afar, my rich dad said. At nine years old, you've gotten a taste of what it feels like to work for money. Just multiply your last month by fifty years, and you'll have an idea of what most people spend their life doing. I don't understand, I said. How did you feel waiting in line to see me, once to get hired and once to ask for more money? Terrible, I said. If you choose to work for money, that is what life is like for many people, said rich dad. And how did you feel when Mrs. Martin dropped three dimes in your hand for three hours' work? I felt like it wasn't enough. It seemed like nothing. I was disappointed. I said. And that is how most employees feel when they look at their paychecks. 
especially after all the tax and other deductions are taken out. At least you got 100%. You mean most workers don't get paid everything, I asked with amazement. Heavens no, said Rich Dad. The government always takes its share first. How do they do that, I asked. Taxes, said Rich Dad. You're taxed when you earn, you're taxed when you spend, you're taxed when you save, you're taxed when you die. Why do people let the government do that to them? The rich don't, said Rich Dad with a smile. The poor and the middle class do. I'll bet you that I earn more than your dad, yet he pays more in taxes. How can that be, I asked. As a nine-year-old boy, that made no sense to me. Why would someone let the government do that to them? Rich Dad sat there in silence. I guess he wanted me to listen instead of jabber away at the mouth. Finally, I calmed down. I did not like what I had heard. I knew my dad complained constantly about paying so much in taxes, but really did nothing about it. Was that life pushing him around? Rich Dad rocked slowly and silently in his chair, just looking at me. Ready to learn? he asked. I nodded my head slowly. Learning how to have money work for you is a lifetime study. Most people go to college for four years and their education ends. I already know that my study of money will continue over a lifetime simply because the more I find out, the more I find out I need to know. Most people never study the subject. They go to work, get their paycheck, balance their checkbooks, and that's it. On top of that, they wonder why they have money problems. Then they think that more money will solve the problem. Few realize that it's their lack of financial education that is the problem. So, my dad has tax problems because he doesn't understand money? I asked, confused. Look, said Rich Dad, taxes are just one small section on learning how to have money work for you. Today, I just wanted to find out if you still have the passion to learn about money. Most people don't. They want to go to school, learn a profession, have fun at their work, and earn lots of money. One day they wake up with big money problems and then they can't stop working. That's the price of only knowing how to work for money instead of studying how to have money work for you. So, do you still have the passion to learn? Asked Rich Dad. I nodded my head. Good, said Rich Dad. Now get back to work. This time I will pay you nothing. What? I asked in amazement. You heard me. Nothing. You'll work the same three hours every Saturday, but this time you will not be paid 10 cents an hour. You said you wanted to learn to not work for money, so I'm not going to pay you anything. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I've already had this conversation with Mike. He's already working, dusting, and stacking canned goods for free. You better hurry up and get back there. I stood there, still not believing what a raw deal I'd been handed. Here I came to ask for a raise, and now I was being told to keep working for nothing. Rich Dad tapped me on the head and said, Use this. Now get out of here. I didn't tell my poor dad I wasn't being paid. He would not have understood, and I did not want to try to explain something that I did not yet understand myself. For three more weeks, Mike and I worked for three hours every Saturday for nothing. The work didn't bother me, and the routine got easier it was the missed baseball games and not being able to afford to buy a few comic books that got to me. Rich Dad stopped by at noon on the third week. We heard his truck pull up in the parking lot and sputter when the engine was turned off. He entered the store and greeted Mrs. Martin with a hug. After finding out how things were going in the store, he reached into the ice cream freezer, pulled out two bars, paid for them, and signaled to Mike and me. Let's go for a walk, boys. We crossed the street, dodging a few cars, and walked across a large grassy field where a few adults were playing softball. Sitting down at a remote picnic table, he handed Mike and me the ice cream bars. How's it going, boys? Okay, Mike said. I nodded in agreement. Learn anything yet? Rich Dad asked. Mike and I looked at each other, shrugged our shoulders, and shook our heads in unison. Well, you boys had better start thinking. You're staring at one of life's biggest lessons. If you learn the lesson, you'll enjoy a life of great freedom and security. If you don't learn the lesson, you'll wind up like Mrs. Martin and most of the people playing softball in this park. They work very hard for a little money, clinging to the illusion of job security, 
looking forward to a three-week vacation each year and a skimpy pension after 45 years of work. Now, if that excites you, I'll give you a raise to 25 cents an hour. But these are good, hard-working people. Are you making fun of them, I demanded? A smile came over Rich Dad's face. Mrs. Martin's like a mother to me, and I would never be that cruel. I may sound cruel because I'm doing my best to point something out to the two of you. I want to expand your point of view so you can see something, something most people never have the benefit of seeing because their vision is too narrow. Most people never see the trap they're in. Mike and I sat there uncertain of his message. He sounded cruel, yet we could sense he was desperately wanting us to know something. With a smile, Rich Dad said, Doesn't that 25 cents an hour sound good? Doesn't that make your heart beat a little faster? I shook my head no, but it really did. 25 cents an hour would be big bucks to me. Okay, I'll pay you a dollar an hour, Rich Dad said with a sly grin. Now my heart was beginning to race. My brain was screaming, take it, take it. I could not believe what I was hearing. Still, I said nothing. Okay, two dollars an hour. My little nine-year-old brain and heart nearly exploded. After all, it was 1956, and being paid two dollars an hour would have made me the richest kid in the world. I couldn't imagine earning that kind of money. I wanted to say yes, but somehow my mouth stayed silent. Maybe my brain had overheated and blown a fuse, but deep down I badly wanted that two dollars an hour. The ice cream had melted and was running down my hand. Rich Dad was looking at two boys staring back at him, eyes wide open and brains empty. He knew that he was testing us, and he knew there was part of our emotions that wanted to take the deal. Okay, he said, five dollars an hour. Suddenly there was a silence from inside me. Something had changed. The offer was too big and had gotten ridiculous. Not too many grown-ups in 1956 made more than five dollars an hour. The temptation disappeared and a calm set in. Slowly I turned to my left to look at Mike. He looked back at me. The part of my soul that was weak and needy was silenced. The part of me that had no price took over. There was a calm and a certainty about money that entered my brain and my soul. I knew Mike had gotten to that point also. Good, Rich Dad said softly. Most people have a price. And they have a price because of human emotions named fear and greed. First, the fear of being without money motivates us to work hard. And then once we get that paycheck, greed or desire starts us thinking about all the wonderful things money can buy. The pattern is then set. What pattern, I asked. The pattern of get up, go to work, pay bills, get up, go to work, pay bills. Their lives are then run forever by two emotions, fear and greed. Offer them more money, and they continue the cycle by also increasing their spending. This is what I call the rat race. There is another way, Mike asked. Yes, said Rich Dad slowly, but only a few people find it. And what is that way, Mike asked. That's what I hope you boys will find out as you work and study with me. That is why I took away all forms of pay. The business was over on opening day. Sweeping the powder up, I looked at Mike and said, I guess Jimmy and his friends are right. We are poor. My father was just leaving as I said that. Boys, he said, you're only poor if you give up. The most important thing is that you did something. Most people only talk and dream of getting rich. You've done something. I'm very proud of the two of you. I will say it again. Keep going. Don't quit. Mike and I stood there in silence. There were nice words, but we still did not know what to do. So how come you're not rich, Dad? I asked. Because I chose to be a school teacher. School teachers really don't think about being rich. We just like to teach. I wish I could help you, but I really don't know how to make money. Mike and I turned and continued our cleanup. I know, said my dad. If you boys want to learn how to be rich, don't ask me. Talk to your dad, Mike. My dad? asked Mike with a scrunched up face. Yeah, your dad, repeated my dad with a smile. 
Your dad and I have the same banker, and he raves about your father. He's told me several times that your father is brilliant when it comes to making money. He seems to be building an empire, and I suspect in a few years he will be a very rich man. With that, Mike and I got excited again. With new vigor, we began cleaning up the mess caused by our now defunct first business. As we were cleaning, we made plans on how and when to talk to Mike's dad. The problem was that Mike's dad worked long hours and often did not come home until late. His father owned warehouses, a construction company, a chain of stores, and three restaurants. It was the restaurants that kept him out late. Mike caught the bus home after we had finished cleaning up. He was going to talk to his dad when he got home that night and ask him if he would teach us how to become rich. Mike promised to call as soon as he talked to his dad, even if it was late. The phone rang at 8.30 p.m. Mike's dad had agreed to meet with Mike and me. At 7.30 Saturday morning, I caught the bus to the poor side of town. Michael and I met with his dad that morning at 8 o'clock. He was already busy and had been at work for more than an hour. His construction supervisor was just leaving in his pickup truck as I walked up to his simple, small, and tidy home. Mike met me at the door. Dad's on the phone, and he said to wait on the back porch, Mike said as he opened the door. The old wooden floor creaked as I stepped across the threshold of his aging house. There was a cheap mat just inside the door. That mat was there to hide the years of wear from countless footsteps that the floor had supported. Although clean, it needed to be replaced. I felt claustrophobic as I entered the narrow living room, which was filled with old, musty, overstuffed furniture that today would be collector's items. Sitting on the couch were two women, a little older than my mom. Across from the women sat a man in workman's clothes. They smiled as Mike and I walked past them, heading for the kitchen, which led to the porch that overlooked the backyard. I smiled back shyly. Who are those people, I asked. Oh, they work for my dad. The older man runs his warehouses, and the women are the managers of the restaurants. And you saw the construction supervisor who's working on a road project about 50 miles from here. His other supervisor, who's building a track of houses, had already left before you got here. Does this go on all the time, I asked? Not always, but quite often, said Mike, smiling as he pulled up a chair to sit down next to me. I asked him if he teaches to make money, Mike said. Oh, and what did he say to that? I asked with cautious curiosity. Well, he had a funny look on his face at first, and then he said he would make us an offer. Oh, I said, rocking my chair back against the wall. I sat there perched on two rear legs of the chair. Mike did the same thing. Suddenly, Mike's dad burst through the rickety screen door and onto the porch. Mike and I jumped to our feet, not out of respect, but because we were startled. Ready, boys? Mike's dad asked as he pulled up a chair to sit down with us. We nodded our heads as we pulled our chairs away from the wall to sit in front of him. He was a big man, about six feet tall and 200 pounds. Mike says that you want to learn how to make money. Is that correct, Robert? I nodded my head quickly, but with a little intimidation. He had a lot of power behind his words and smile. Okay, here's my offer. I'll teach you, but I won't do it classroom style. You work for me, and I'll teach you. You don't work for me, I don't teach you. I can teach you faster if you work, and I'm wasting my time if you just want to sit and listen like you do in school. That's my offer. Take it or leave it. Um, may I ask a question first, I asked. Nope, take it or leave it. I've got too much work to do to waste my time. If you can't make up your mind decisively, then you'll never learn to make money anyway. Take it, I said. Take it, said Mike. Good, said Mike's dad. Mrs. Martin will be by in ten minutes. After I'm through with her, you ride with her to my superette, and you can begin working. I'll pay you ten cents an hour, and you will work for three hours every Saturday. But I have a softball game today, I said. Mike's dad lowered his voice to a stern tone. Take it or leave it, he said. I'll take it, I replied, choosing to work and learn instead of playing softball. By 9 a.m. on a beautiful Saturday morning, Mike and I were working for Mrs. Martin. She was a kind and patient woman. She always said that Mike and I reminded her of her two sons who were grown and gone. Although kind, she believed in hard work and she kept us working. She was a taskmaster. We spent three hours taking canned goods off the shelves and with a feather duster, brushing each can to get the dust off and then restacking them neatly. 
It was excruciatingly boring work. For three weeks, Mike and I reported to Mrs. Martin and worked our three hours. By noon, our work was over, and she dropped three little dimes in each of our hands. Now, even at the age of nine in the mid-50s, 30 cents was not too exciting. Comic books cost 10 cents back then, so I usually spent my money on comic books and went home. By Wednesday of the fourth week, I was ready to quit. I had agreed to work only because I wanted to learn to make money from Mike's dad. And now I was a slave for 10 cents an hour. On top of that, I had not seen Mike's dad since that first Saturday. I'm quitting, I told Mike at lunchtime. The school lunch was miserable. School was boring, and now I didn't even have my Saturdays to look forward to. But it was the 30 cents that really got to me. Mike smiled. Dad said this would happen. He said to meet with him when you were ready to quit. What? I said indignantly. He's been waiting for me to get fed up? Sort of, Mike said. Dad's kind of different. He teaches differently from your dad. Your mom and dad lecture a lot. My dad is quiet and a man of few words. You just wait till this Saturday. I'll tell him you're ready. You mean I've been set up? No, not really, but maybe. Dad will explain on Saturday. I was ready to face him, and I was prepared. Even my real dad was angry with him. My real dad, the one I call the poor one, thought that my rich dad was violating child labor laws and should be investigated. My educated dad told me to demand what I deserve, at least 25 cents an hour. My poor dad told me that if I didn't get a raise, I was to quit immediately. At 8 o'clock Saturday morning, I was going through the same rickety door of Mike's house. Take a seat and wait in line, Mike's dad said as I entered. He turned and disappeared into his little office next to a bedroom. I looked around the room and didn't see Mike anywhere. Feeling awkward, I cautiously sat down next to the same two women who were there four weeks earlier. They smiled and slid across the couch to make room for me. Forty-five minutes went by and I was steaming. The two women had met with him and left thirty minutes earlier. An older gentleman was in there for twenty minutes and was also gone. The house was empty and I sat out in his musty dark living room on a beautiful sunny Hawaiian day waiting to talk to a cheapskate who exploited children. I could hear him rustling around in the office, talking on the phone and ignoring me. I was now ready to walk out, but for some reason I stayed. Finally, Fifteen minutes later, at exactly nine o'clock, Rich Dad walked out of his office, said nothing, and signaled with his hand for me to enter his dingy office. I understand you want to raise or you're going to quit, Rich Dad said as he swiveled in his office chair. Well, you're not keeping your end of the bargain, I blurted out nearly in tears. It was really frightening for a nine-year-old boy to confront a grown-up. You said that you'd teach me if I worked for you. Well, I've worked for you. I've worked hard. I've given up my baseball games to work for you, and, and you don't keep your word. You haven't taught me anything. You're, you're a crook like everyone in town thinks you are. You're greedy. You want all the money and don't take care of your employees. You make me wait and don't show me any respect. I'm only a little boy, and I deserve to be treated better. Rich Dad rocked back in his swivel chair, hands up to his chin, somewhat staring at me. Not bad, he said. In less than a month, you sound like most of my employees. What? I asked. Not understanding what he was saying, I continued with my grievance. I thought you were going to keep up your end of the bargain and teach me. Instead, you want to torture me. That's cruel. That's really cruel. As a young boy, having two strong fathers, both influencing me, was difficult. I wanted to be a good son and listen, but the two fathers did not say the same things. The contrast in their points of view, particularly where money was concerned, was so extreme that I grew curious and intrigued. I began to start thinking for long periods of time about what each was saying. Much of my private time was spent reflecting, asking myself questions such as, why does he say that? And then asking the same question of the other dad's statement. It would have been much easier to simply say, yeah, he's right, I agree with that, or to simply reject the point of view by saying, the old man doesn't know what he's talking about. Instead, having two dads whom I love force me to think and ultimately choose a way of thinking for myself. As a process, choosing to think for myself turned out to be much more valuable in the long run 
rather than simply accepting or rejecting a single point of view. One of the reasons the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, and the middle class struggles in debt is because the subject of money is taught at home, not in school. Most of us learn about money from our parents. So what can a poor parent tell their child about money? They simply say, stay in school and study hard. The child may graduate with excellent grades, but with a poor person's financial programming and mindset. It was learned while the child was young. Money is not taught in schools. Schools focus on scholastic and professional skills, but not financial skills. This explains how smart bankers, doctors, and accountants who are in excellent grades in school may still struggle financially all their lives. Our staggering national debt is due in large part to highly educated politicians and government officials making financial decisions with little or no training on the subject of money. I often look ahead to a new millennium and wonder what will happen when we have millions of people who will need financial and medical assistance. They will be dependent upon their families or the government for financial support. What will happen when Medicare and Social Security run out of money? How will a nation survive if teaching children about money continues to be left to parents, most of whom will be, or already are, poor? Because I had two influential fathers, I learned from both of them. I had to think about each dad's advice, and in doing so, I gained valuable insight into the power and effect of one's thoughts on one's life. For example, one dad had a habit of saying, I can't afford it. The other dad forbade those words to be used. He insisted I say, how can I afford it? One is a statement and the other is a question. One lets you off the hook and the other forces you to think. My soon to be a rich dad would explain that by automatically saying the words, I can't afford it, your brain stops working. By asking the question, how can I afford it? Your brain is put to work. He did not mean buy everything you wanted. He was fanatical about exercising your mind the most powerful computer in the world. My brain gets stronger every day because I exercise it. The stronger it gets, the more money I can make. He believed that automatically saying, I can't afford it, was a sign of mental laziness. Although both dads worked hard, I noticed that one dad had a habit of putting his brain to sleep when it came to money matters, and the other had a habit of exercising his brain. The long-term result was that one dad grew stronger financially and the other grew weaker. It is not much different from a person who goes to the gym to exercise on a regular basis versus someone who sits on the couch watching television. Proper physical exercise increases your chances for health and proper mental exercise increases your chances for wealth. Laziness decreases both health and wealth. My two dads had opposing attitudes and thought. One dad thought that the rich should pay more in taxes and take care of those less fortunate. The other said, taxes punish those who produce and reward those who don't produce. One dad recommended, study hard so you can find a good company to work for. The other recommended, study hard so you can find a good company to buy. One dad said, the reason I'm not rich is because I have you kids. The other said, the reason I must be rich is because I have you kids. One dad encouraged talking about money and business at the dinner table. The other forbade the subject of money to be discussed over a meal. One said, when it comes to money, play it safe and don't take risks. The other said, learn to manage risk. One believed, our home is our largest investment and our greatest asset. The other believed, my house is a liability and if your house is your largest investment, you're in trouble. Both dads paid their bills on time. If one paid his bills first, while the other paid his bills last. Being a product of two strong dads allowed me the luxury of observing the effects different thoughts have on one's life. I noticed that people really do shape their life through their thoughts. For example, my poor dad always said, I'll never be rich. And that prophecy became reality. My rich dad, on the other hand, always referred to himself as rich. He would say things like, I'm a rich man, and rich people don't do this. Even when he was flat broke, after a major financial setback, 
he continued to refer to himself as a rich man. He would cover himself by saying, There is a difference between being poor and being broke. Broke is temporary and poor is eternal. My poor dad would also say, I'm not interested in money or money doesn't matter. My rich dad always said, money is power. The power of our thoughts may never be measured or appreciated, but it became obvious to me as a young boy to be aware of my thoughts and how I expressed myself. I noticed that my poor dad was poor not because of the amount of money he earned, which was significant, but because of his thoughts and his actions. As a young boy, having two fathers, I became acutely aware of being careful which thoughts I chose to adopt as my own. Whom should I listen to? My rich dad or my poor dad? Although both men had tremendous respect for education and learning, they disagreed in what they thought was important to learn. One wanted me to study hard, earn a degree, and get a good job to work for money. He wanted me to study to become a professional, an attorney, or an accountant, or to go to business school for my MBA. The other encouraged me to study to be rich, to understand how money works, and learn how to have it work for me. I don't work for money, were the words he would repeat over and over. Money works for me. At the age of nine, I decided to listen to and learn from my rich dad about money. In doing so, I chose not to listen to my poor dad, even though he was the one with all the college degrees. Once I made up my mind whom to listen to, my education about money began. My rich dad taught me over a period of 30 years, until I was age 39. He stopped once he realized that I knew and fully understood what he had been trying to drum into my often thick skull. Money is one form of power, but what is more powerful is financial education. Money comes and goes, but if you have the education about how money works, you gain power over it and can begin building wealth. The reason positive thinking alone does not work is because most people went to school and never learned how money works so they spend their lives working for money. Because I was only nine years old when I started, the lessons my rich dad taught me were simple. And when it was all said and done, there are only six main lessons repeated over 30 years. This book is about those six lessons, put as simply as possible as my rich dad put forth those lessons to me. The lessons are not meant to be answers, but guideposts. Guideposts that will assist you and your children to grow wealthier, no matter what happens in the world, of increasing change and uncertainty. Dad, can you tell me how to get rich? My dad put down the evening paper. Why do you want to get rich, son? Because today Jimmy's mom drove up in their new Cadillac and they were going to their beach house for the weekend. He took three of his friends, but Mike and I weren't invited. They told us we weren't invited because we were poor kids. They did? My dad asked incredulously. Yeah, they did, I replied in a hurt tone. My dad silently shook his head, pushed his glasses up the bridge of his nose, and went back to reading his paper. I stood waiting for an answer. The year was 1956. I was nine years old. By some twist of fate, I attended the same public school where the rich people sent their kids. We were primarily a sugar plantation town. The managers of the plantation and the other affluent people of the town, such as doctors, business owners, and bankers, sent their children to this school, grades one to six. After grade six, their children were generally sent off to private schools. Because my family lived on one side of the street, I went to this school. Had I lived on the other side of the street, I would have gone to a different school with kids from families more like mine. After grade six, these kids and I would go on to the public intermediate and high school. There was no private school for them or for me. My dad finally put down the paper. Well, son, he began slowly. If you want to be rich, you have to learn to make money. How do I make money, I asked. Well, use your head, son, he said, smiling. Which really meant, that's all I'm going to tell you, or, uh, I don't know the answer, so don't embarrass me. The next morning, I told my best friend Mike what my dad had said. As best I could tell, Mike and I were the only poor kids in this school. Mike was like me in that he was in this school by a twist of fate. Someone had drawn a jog in a line for the school district, 
and we wound up in school with the rich kids. So what do we do to make money? Mike asked. I don't know, I said. But do you want to be my partner? He agreed. And so on that Saturday morning, Mike became my first business partner. We spent all morning coming up with ideas on how to make money. Finally that afternoon, a bolt of lightning came through our heads. It was an idea that Mike had gotten from a science book he'd read. Excitedly, we shook hands, and the partnership now had a business. For the next several weeks, Mike and I ran around our neighborhood, knocking on doors and asking our neighbors if they'd save their toothpaste tubes for us. With puzzled looks, most adults consented with a smile. Some asked us what we were doing, to which we replied, We can't tell you. It's a business secret. My mom grew distressed as the weeks wore on. We had selected a site next to her washing machine as the place we would stockpile our raw materials. In a brown cardboard box that one time held ketchup bottles, our little pile of used toothpaste tubes began to grow. One day my dad drove up to see two nine-year-old boys in the driveway with a production line operating at full speed. Fine white powder everywhere. On a long table were small milk cartons from school, and our family's hibachi grill was glowing with red-hot coals at maximum heat. Dad walked up cautiously, having to park the car at the base of the driveway, since the production line blocked the carport. As he got closer, he saw a steel pot sitting on top of the coals, with the toothpaste tubes being melted down. In those days, toothpaste did not come in plastic tubes. The tubes were made of lead. So once the paint was burned off, the tubes were dropped in a small steel pot, melted until they became liquid, and with my mom's pot holders, we were pouring the lead through a small hole in the top of the milk cartons. The milk cartons were filled with plaster of Paris. The white powder everywhere was the plaster before we mixed it with water. The milk cartons were the outer containers for plaster of Paris molds. My dad watched as we carefully poured the molten lead through a small hole in the top of the plaster of Paris cube. What are you boys doing? He asked with a cautious smile. We're doing what you told me to do. We're going to be rich, I said. Yep, said Mike, grinning and nodding his head. We're partners. And what is in those plaster molds? Dad asked. Watch, I said. This should be a good match. With a small hammer, I tapped at the seal that divided the cube in half. Cautiously, I pulled up the top half of the plaster mold, and a lead nickel fell out. Oh, my God, my dad said. You're casting nickels out of lead. That's right, Mike said. We're making money. My dad smiled and shook his head. Along with a fire and a box of spent toothpaste tubes in front of him were two little boys covered with white dust and smiling from ear to ear. He asked us to put everything down and sit with him on the front step of our house. With a smile, he gently explained what the word counterfeiting meant. Our dreams were dashed. You mean this is illegal? asked Mike. Yes, it is illegal, my dad said gently. But you boys have shown great creativity and original thought. Keep going. I'm really proud of you. Disappointed, Mike and I sat in silence for about 20 minutes before we began cleaning up our mess. I know, because I hire bean counters. All they think about is cutting costs and raising prices, which causes more problems. Bean counting is important. I, I wish more people knew it, but it too is not the whole picture, added Rich Dad angrily. So is there an answer? asked Mike. Yes, said Rich Dad. Learn to use your emotions to think, not think with your emotions. When you boys mastered your emotions, first by agreeing to work for free, I knew there was hope. When you again resisted your emotions, when I tempted you with more money, you were again learning to think in spite of being emotionally charged. That's the first step. Can you tell the difference between emotions thinking and the head thinking? Mike asked. Oh, yes, I hear it all the time, said Rich Dad. I hear things like, well, everyone has to work, or the rich are crooks, or I'll get another job. I deserve this raise. You can't push me around, or I like this job because it's secure. Instead of, is there something I'm missing here? Which breaks the emotional thought and gives you time to think clearly. I must admit it was a great lesson to be getting, to know when someone was speaking out of emotions or out of clear thought. 
It was a lesson that served me well for life, especially when I was the one speaking out of reaction and not from clear thought. As we headed back to the store, Rich Dad explained that the rich really did make money. They did not work for it. He went on to explain that when Mike and I were casting five cent pieces out of lead, thinking we were making money, we were very close to thinking the way rich people think. The problem was that it was illegal for us to do it. Rich Dad went on to explain that the rich know that money is an illusion, truly like the carrot for the donkey. It's only out of fear and greed that the illusion of money is held together by billions of people thinking that money is real. Money is really made up. It was only because of the illusion of confidence and the ignorance of the masses that the house of cards stood standing. In fact, he said, in many ways the donkey's carrot was more valuable than money. As he climbed into his pickup truck, outside of his little convenience store, he said, Keep working, boys. But the sooner you forget about needing a paycheck, the easier your adult life will be. Keep using your brain. Work for free. And soon your mind will show you ways of making money far beyond what I could ever pay you. You'll begin to see opportunities right in front of you that in the past would have gone unnoticed. Mike and I picked up our things from the store and waved goodbye to Mrs. Martin. We went back to the park, to the same picnic bench, and spent several more hours thinking and talking. We spent the next week at school thinking and talking. For two more weeks, we kept thinking and talking and working for free. At the end of the second Saturday, I was again saying goodbye to Mrs. Martin and looking at the comic book stand with a longing gaze. The hard thing about not even getting 30 cents every Saturday was that I didn't have any money to buy comic books. Suddenly, as Mrs. Martin was saying goodbye to Mike and me, I saw something she was doing that I'd never seen her do before. I mean, I'd seen her do it, but I never took notice of it. Mrs. Martin was cutting the front page of the comic book in half. She was keeping the top half of the comic book cover and throwing the rest of the comic book into a large brown cardboard box. When I asked her what she did with the comic book, she said, I throw them away. I give the top half of the cover back to the comic book distributor for credit when he brings in the new comics. He's coming in an hour. Mike and I waited for an hour. Soon the distributor arrived and I asked him if we could have the comic books. To which he replied, You can have them if you work for this store and do not resell them. Our partnership was revived. Mike's mom had a spare room in the basement that no one used. We cleaned it out and began piling hundreds of comic books in that room. Soon our comic book library was open to the public. We hired Mike's younger sister, who loved to study, to be head librarian. She charged each child 10 cents admission to the library, which was open from 2.30 to 4.30 p.m. every day after school. The customers, the children of the neighborhood, could read as many comics as they could in two hours. It was a bargain for them, since a comic cost 10 cents each, and they could read five or six in two hours. Mike's sister would check the kids as they left to make sure they weren't borrowing any comic books. She also kept the books, logging in how many kids showed up each day, who they were, and any comments they might have. Mike and I averaged $9.50 per week over a three-month period. We paid his sister a dollar a week and allowed her to read the comics for free, which she rarely did since she was always studying. Mike and I kept our agreement by working in the store every Saturday and collecting all the comic books from the different stores. We kept our agreement to the distributor by not selling any comic books. We burned them once they got too tattered. We tried opening a branch office, but we could never quite find someone as dedicated as Mike's sister we could trust. At an early age, we found out how hard it was to find good staff. Three months after the library first opened, a fight broke out in the room. Some bullies from another neighborhood pushed their way in and started it. Mike's dad suggested we shut down the business. So our comic book business was shut down and we stopped working on Saturdays at the convenience store. Anyway, Rich Dad was excited because he had new things he wanted to teach us. He was happy because we'd learned our first lesson so well. We'd learned to have money work for us. By not getting paid for our work at the store, we were forced to use our imaginations to identify an opportunity to make money. By starting our own business, the 
comic book library, we were in control of our own finances, not dependent on an employer. The best part was that our business generated money for us, even when we weren't physically there. Our money worked for us. Instead of paying us money, Rich Dad had given us so much more. Lesson 2. Why Teach Financial Literacy in 1990, my best friend Mike took over his father's empire and is in fact doing a better job than his dad did. We see each other once or twice a year on the golf course. He and his wife are wealthier than you could imagine. Rich Dad's empire is in great hands, and Mike is now grooming his son to take his place, as his dad groomed us. In 1994, I retired at the age of 47, and my wife Kim was 37. Retirement does not mean not working. To my wife and me, it means that, barring unforeseen cataclysmic changes, we can work or not work, and our wealth grows automatically, staying way ahead of inflation. I guess it means freedom. The assets are large enough to grow by themselves. It's like planting a tree. You water it for years, and then one day it doesn't need you anymore. Its roots have gone down deep enough. Then the tree provides shade for your enjoyment. Mike chose to run the empire, and I chose to retire. Whenever I speak to groups of people, they often ask what I would recommend or what could they do? How do they get started? Is there a good book I'd recommend? What is the secret to success? I simply say to them what my rich dad said back to me when I was a little kid. If you want to be rich, you need to be financially literate. That idea was drummed into my head every time we were together. As I said, my educated dad stressed the importance of reading books, while my rich dad stressed the need to master financial literacy. If you're going to build the Empire State Building, the first thing you need to do is dig a deep hole and pour a strong foundation. If you're going to build a home in the suburbs, all you need to do is pour a six-inch slab of concrete. Most people, in their drive to get rich, are trying to build an Empire State Building on a six-inch slab. Our school system, having been created in the agrarian age, believes in homes with no foundation dirt floors are still the rage. So kids graduate from school with virtually no financial foundation. One day, sleepless and deep in debt in suburbia, living the American dream, they decide that the answer to their financial problems is to find a way to get rich quick. Construction on the skyscraper begins. It goes up quickly and soon, instead of the Empire State Building, we have the leaning tower of suburbia. The sleepless nights return. As for Mike and me in our adult years, both of our choices were possible because we were taught to pour a strong financial foundation when we were just kids. Now, accounting is possibly the most boring subject in the world. It also could be the most confusing. But if you want to be rich, long term, it could be the most important subject. The question is, how do you take a boring and confusing subject and teach it to kids? The answer is, make it simple. My rich dad poured a strong financial foundation for Mike and me. Since we were just kids, he created a simple way to teach us. For years, he only drew pictures and used words. Mike and I understood the simple drawings, the jargon, the movement of money. And then in later years, rich dad began adding numbers. Most importantly, you must know the difference between an asset and a liability.